is this this is the program. Kathy, did you want to say any closing words? Well, it would be good to hear um, questions, ideas, comments, thoughts. Right. What could we hear from you? We begin to have these types of gatherings in the offices of elected incumbents. I just, I'm sorry, I didn't, you're elected? Incumbents. Incumbents, I see, yeah. You know, for a while, Voices did organize a, what we called the Occupation Project. This was before Occupy. And, uh, I think it was a good idea. We would go into the offices of um, elected representatives, and this was at a time when uh, regularly supplemental spending bills for war in Iraq would come up. And I mean, I'm from a, an area where the Democratic representative is just spot on on every single issue except wars, and she will, uh, I mean, it's, it's by spot on, I mean, we really appreciated what she did for people who were homeless or who were new immigrants or who were being um, pushed out of the neighborhood, but she kept on supporting wars. Anyway, we would occupy the offices of people and say that we'd be prepared to leave when they could give us some uh, assurance that they would vote against the next Iraqi supplemental funding bill or give us some reasoning as to why it made sense to continue funding war in Iraq. And of the offices wherein elected representatives did finally change their vote from a yes note to a no vote, there were 18 such representatives, in every single one of them, members of the Occupy Project had been in those offices. So uh, it was a good, a good arrow pointing toward what could be. So I'm mm -hmm. glad to hear you say that. Uh, I think something is changing in terms of uh, readiness to go to war again, at any rate. Uh, we've long said that one of the ways to stop a next war is to keep telling the truth about this war, whether it's the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan or the war against poor people here in the United States, to keep telling that truth. And I, I think, you know, it was interesting that when 192 people in the Congress said to President Obama, mm -mm, we cannot authorize you to go to war against Syria, that wasn't preceded by big, huge demonstrations or marches or people in the street. I think it was the result of public opinion. Now, some of that public opinion came from the Tea Party or from people who hate Obama no matter what he does. But I think a great deal of it was also generated by people who said, we are sick to death. We're exhausted by the war making. Now, we're exhausted. Imagine how people in Iraq feel. Imagine people in Afghanistan and all the other places where the United States has uh, menaced and punished people because we don't like their governments. Uh, but there, I think it's a different time. It's a different time also because we have uh, this rather extraordinary pope who is, I think, uh, saying things that have not been expected from somebody in a really um, high place that used to be kind of identified with the bigs, with the elites, with the corporations even. So maybe now we'll hear from some others. Maybe others will start to take a risk and speak out or not. Uh, look over their shoulders as much. Uh, that's encouraging to me. I think um, I sense uh, it's pure intuition, but being just in this month of September in multiple different high schools and universities, I'm sensing that we have a new generation who are not so um, burdened by fears that uh, I think young people were feeling in a, in a sort of a almost knee-jerk, reactionary way. You have to be afraid, be very, very afraid. Well, 9-11 um, is quite a bit past us, and I think um, sometimes young people might be more afraid of what environmentally is being done to our collective habitat than they are of what some terrorist group out there might uh, randomly do. So it's a good time to be doing as much outreach and education as we possibly can, and to keep trying to tell the truth that aren't easy to look at or to hear. Um, and then to build bridges, which, uh, you know, as Kathy has said, it's, it's hard enough to get into Iraq at all, much less into Baghdad. 
and then to build bridges with people who initially face you with silence. But by staying in the room and by communicating that she wanted to hear from people, I think Kathy did hear words that we need to hear. So to build those bridges, and with the young people in Afghanistan, every month on the 21st they do a phone call, an international Skype phone call. It's called Global Days of Listening. And I find those getting better and better all the time. I mean, the young people are getting older, and their questions and answers are maturing quite a bit and challenging us more all the time. But also, um, it would be possible to make those hookups between any group of people here in Rochester who at any given time might say, well, we'd like to talk with your friends in Afghanistan. We can arrange that, and, and we'd be happy to do so. Um, it's difficult to look at mm. legislation that might mm -hmm. be meaningful at this point, because there, there's just not much there that's calling for an end to uh, United States war making and United States weapon procurement and United States weapon storage and usage. Uh, but I think uh, it's, there, there's, there is a possibility that um, something can come like, after Occupy. And let's not lose sight of the fact that in 12 weeks, the Occupy movement took the logo 99 and 1 and globalized it. I mean, some of us have spent most of our adult lives trying to, you know, just make it sort of well known in one area. And they got it all around the globe, they being a very collective they. And so who knows, who's to say what might be coming around the corner next? And that does give me a great deal of hope. The other thing is that uh, if we make those who are the most impoverished our number one priority, mm -hmm. a lot of other questions become much easier <laughs> to identify and sometimes even to, to answer. And I know I'm in a room with people who for decades have made that commitment to make the, the poorest, the most needy, our number one priority. So thank you for all of the witness and the work that Rochester uh, stands for, and that we've been so really grateful to experience in our small visits. Um, anyway, but this isn't to cut off a chance for a discussion. Other questions, thoughts, ideas? Thank you. So I understand that there's still thousands of U.S. troops in, oh, yeah. in these countries we've been talking about. They're still there. Maybe they're being withdrawn, but maybe not very fast. Most of us have marched with Get, get out of Afghanistan, get out of Iraq, signs. Um, but it's complicated. So what, what would happen to people we've been seeing in these pictures if, if all the U.S. troops got out? Mm. Would they be better off right away mm. or gradually? Or would they be worse off? Peter, it's so hard to say. I mean, when the troops left Iraq, um, things did not get better. The possibility of civil war always seemed to be looming or returning. But I think it's important to note that Iraq was uh, just open season for people to bring in weapons. There was no weapon embargo. There was no serious checkpoint effort to prevent weapons from going in. If anything, the United States aimed, armed the sons of Iraq to fight against the Shia groups. and so. Every other country that's wanted to fight a proxy war has just flooded Iraq with their um, potential suicide bombers, uh, with their weapons, and with their fighters. So it, it's, a, it's a horrid situation in Iraq right now. In Afghanistan, the Taliban are not the only armed fighting group. Uh, that's one of the great fears right now, that you have people who represent the Haqqani network, Bobadin Hekmatyar has got a whole network. Each of the warlords that Buddy mentioned, uh, and every cabinet level minister, with the exception of the Ministry of Agriculture, is a warlord. So, how much relevance does the United States have to protecting people in that situation? Uh, they're going to keep nine bases. Now, there are 27 million people in Afghanistan and 34 provinces. The nine major bases, that's a substantial number of bases, the United States is going to keep three prisons. And the United States will 
maintain 20,000 troops. They've got 60,000 there now. And 100,000 security contractors are over there. And there's no mention of pulling all of them out. And they're not responsible to the United States military, even though the US taxpayer pays them through the military. So how much departure are we really seeing? What do all these joint special operations forces and their paramilitary security contractor counterparts do? Well, they are very capable of doing night raids, calling in drone attacks, and calling in combat brigade helicopter attacks. This, of course, stirs up even greater resentment, as Betty said, that's a way to more or less recruit for mm -hmm. Taliban and other armed group fighting. So I, I have to say it just about makes my Irish temper blow. If I hear somebody say, well, I'm not a militarist, but I don't want to abandon the women and children of Afghanistan mm -hmm. um, to the Taliban if our troops leave. And that's kind of in the lore that our troops are there to protect them. But it's just simply not true. The, the, what a woman in a rural part of Afghanistan most wants protection from is her child's risk of starving to death, or having a combination of starvation and gastroenteritis, or being one of the one million children suffering acute malnourishment in the southern provinces. Or a woman fears that she'll go into childbirth and be one out of the 11 women that dies in childbirth. Uh, families fear displacement by the war, um, but as I say, the war will continue as long as the United States troops are in place. And what have the United States troops done when their huge, sprawling military bases are right across the road from these refugee camps that just seem to go on and on? And you see convoys going into the U.S. bases laden with food and clean water and fuel. And they're riding right past wretched circumstances wherein people don't have jobs, they don't have food, they certainly don't have fuel. They're living in uh, tents that are sort of mud huts covered with a plastic tarp and maybe a very old army issued blanket from some pre previous war. Uh, and so how are the U.S. people protecting those people? Uh, as one young child said, looking up at a big beautiful palace and then he was actually going through the Afghan peace volunteers' garbage at the moment, and he and his friends managed to separate out a few pieces of very old bread and some scraps of paper that were valuable to them. And he said, look at how they live, and look at how we live. And at the week that I read that, uh, I also read in U.S. papers about how a colonel from the, you know, a general from the United States military uh, General Kurt Schein, I believe, was saying, this is the largest retrograde mission, military mission in history. And he was kind of bragging about how they were going to melt down uh, mine-resistant anti-personnel carriers that the United States didn't want to ship back and they didn't want to sell. And the reason they couldn't sell them, really, was because they didn't work. They didn't protect anybody from r improvised roadside explosives. And so they were going to melt them down, and that was going to cost $7 billion. And another operation to truck out all the supplies from the military bases they are closing would cost another $7 billion. And he said, this is the largest retrograde mission we're making history. Mm -hmm. Well, what if we were making history spending $14 billion to try to assure that people had potable water or that the rural agricultural infrastructure could be restored. It would cost $34 billion, and that's a lot of money for our economy. But it's 17 weeks of the war. $2 billion per week, two times 17 is 34, 17 weeks of the war. $1 million per soldier per year. This is what we spent in Afghanistan. So as we start to ask those kinds of questions, it's, it's very, very impossible, I think, to think that the United States has been over there to protect women and children. But then if you start to ask about what natural gases and fossil fuels exist around the Caspian Sea, or what kinds of rare earth minerals are under the Hindu Kush mountains, lithium and dibithium and things we use in our cell phones and our computers, and how new roadways are being 
designed in the militarist minds, and a, a new pipeline, which would be an extension of one they dreamed of having before, then the ability to control the pricing and the flow of essential resources might have everything to do with why the United States wants to be in a country that borders China and is close to Russia. So we can make a choice. Um, and that's how we have those jars back there. You know, what, what do we want to choose? Reconstruction and reparation or continued war? And, you know, when we look at just the disaster that has befallen Iraq, and I can still remember my dear mother saying, uh, Kathy, dear, what you don't understand is the people of Iraq should have gotten rid of Saddam Hussein a long time ago if they didn't. And we went in there and did it for them. And they ought to be grateful. And they're not. And my mom got that from Fox News. So we have to retell that story. Um, I was so happy this evening to watch an old video that was unearthed, really, that showed my mother as part of a group of people who had been brought together on the southwest side of Chicago to think about the Vietnam War. And the people were against the war, but every person was saying they were against the war because of what it was doing to our boys or what it had done to our economy. And my mother said, those people over there in Vietnam have been hit by these bombs for year after year, and I imagine they must be tired of the war, and their children have never had a year without war. So I was so glad to hear my mother's voice <laughs> before she got hit with Fox News. <laughs> Thank you. I was... Uh, Really, I, with the whole thing with Syria, I just was so angry because, you know, um, well, first of all, what was, what's going on in Syria is, is so sad, but then the way that with the, you know, the, the propaganda that this country used with the, um, the gassing, and I, you know, and I'm thinking, and then I see Henry Kissinger sitting there at the table giving them advice, and I'm going, oh my God, you know, it's all the war criminals around here. And, and I thought about, you know, as you were saying, Fallujah, and, and the white phosphorus that we use, and, and the depleted uranium, and yet, you know, nobody says stuff, you know, and, and the, the use of women, oh, we, we're going to free the women, but what do we do in Congo? Nothing. You know, and, and what is happening here with women, we're getting more oppressed as they're, they're making these laws, you know. So it, it just, um, the profit propaganda machine is just flowing, and, and as I said, to see these longtime war criminals sitting around the table and saying, oh yes, we're getting advice from them. Yeah, so what, we can commit worse war crimes? Um, it was just, it just blew my mind. But how we think that, you know, it's say as I do, not, you know, say as I say, do as I say, not as I do, it seems to be our policy. And it just seems that we can do whatever the hell we want, but, don't you do anything or we'll condemn you. And even if you don't do it, we'll make sure that we create a situation so we can do what we want to do. And it, it just really, I, I found myself getting so angry in the sense that, uh, you know, it's just continual. But do you think that the propaganda marketed the war that successfully this time? I think that, um, no, I don't think it did. But I think that it's still, um, you know, like as, I think that we still are so isolated from the crimes that we commit and that we, we don't hold our own leaders accountable. Um, and I think that, you know, we, tr you know, everybody will say, um, well, you know, and, and I mean, we let them off the hook, and then the next president comes in and they let the next person off the hook. You know, it's, it's perpetual, and nobody is ever held accountable. And it's very frustrating, because, you know, in my, you know, these guys have committed the, the ultimate in crimes. And, um, you know, I was very sad when 
it seemed like Obama got elected and everybody just, the peace movement kind of just seemed to, a lot of it, and the energy seemed to like wait and see, wait and see, and it never got that energy back. I think that there's still a lot of people that are actively, you know, working, but it just, um, I think a lot of things just seem to kind of lose its energy when Obama, and I would love to see them recall his uh, Peace Prize, yeah. because uh, he definitely doesn't deserve, well, he never deserved it, but, you know, it's it definitely, he, that should be a recall. But um, it, it just really bothered me to see, as I said, seeing Henry Kissinger sitting there, and, and the same people that have, you know, for decades, perpetuated this war thing and people saying, oh, you know, look at Henry Kissinger, like he's a, he's somebody who we need to listen to and he's revered as a great leader and he's, he's an atrocious, terrible man who has done, you know, conceived terrible things. <laughs> Sorry. I guess it was more of a rant. <laughs> I, you know what, sometimes I think if you could put a red dot on the map in the United States for every group that's trying to work towards social change in some fashion, those red dots would start to blur together into being, a, you know, it would be like an ink stain. It would really fill out in many, many parts of the United States. And, uh, um, I don't know, I, I've, I've often thought, well, let me not point a finger at someone else unless I'm willing to let that you know, come back to me and how, how comfortable I am living with all that we sort of take for granted here as being what, what we should have. Well, why should we have all this when all kinds of people in other parts of the world don't have a teeny fraction of what we have in terms of electricity and running water and clean water and um, you know, relative safety and transportation and all these comforts. So I think there, there tends to be a sense, you know, in which we tell the leaders, look, don't rock the boat, you know, don't rock the boat too much because we don't want to upset our comforts. Uh, but I think that could be changing. I think there, I think there's a, a, an awareness developing that, that we just can't remain on the observation deck enjoying the view of a train that's going over the abyss. And I think people are starting to recognize that, you know, Fukushima could have been elsewhere on the planet. It could have been in the United States. And that at any rate, you know, it will have reverberations. And I was just going to say it is in yeah. the United States now. Yeah. I think, I, I think that we might start to see some changes, even if the leaders aren't very good at catching up. Um, here? Yeah, well, it, I guess the, it, I, I've been struggling to grasp the meaning and the direction of the way things have been going and, and whether our leaders have any sense of what they're doing or whether they're just striking out randomly. I, I, it, it comes back to that, that saying that Dorothy Day stole from the Wobblies and I think of building a society within the new, within the shell of the old because I, there's just every indication that this civilization, if you want to call it, that doesn't have much longer before we're going to be faced with total collapse. And, and so we need to keep protesting, but we also need to build new ways of living that are as independent of the power structure as, uh -huh. as we can get. I haven't done a very good job of it, but I know we need to do it. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. You know, and, and I. Uh, I do hear this coming from other quarters too, uh, you know, leaderless uh, movements. Uh, I think that um, to, to whatever extent possible, it's good to try and stay in touch with things that are happening movement-wise in other parts of the world, you know, Bangladeshi fabric workers who uh, mm -hmm. take big risks to go out on massive strikes, and mm -hmm. Chilean students who 
are you know now at the negotiating table at the highest political levels because uh, they can't ignore the student movement and they've said you know our education is fraudulent we end up with huge debts and no jobs. Uh, what's been happening in many parts of India is people have um, said no we we can't accept these socioeconomic inequities and have passed really remarkable legislation uh, guaranteeing the right to work and um, the food security provision, uh, the right to information. Uh, so uh, even in Afghanistan, you know, here are these young kids uh, doing their very, very best to try to communicate to the world beyond that they want to live without war. And for young people who've been huddled around a cell phone in the mountains of Bamiyan in a pup tent <laughs> accompanying us while we did a fast to, about Guantanamo, that was the start of our connection with them. They, they really had a remarkable outreach since that point in time. Um, so it may, yeah, I, I, empires don't go down quietly. No, no. But they may be on that decline. Is uh, someone hyping and hijacking uh, tensions between Sunnis and Shia? Uh, Kathy, what, what was the question? Is someone hyping and hijacking the tensions between Shia and Sunni? Boy, I, I, I would surmise yes, but uh, I mean, I think there are many players who want to see Iraq remain unstable, and uh, they never confess. Mm. They, they never come out and say, "I want to see." Iraq unstable. I haven't mm -hmm. heard, you know. I mean, Al Qaeda has a a very big role in a lot of the violence that's going on in Iraq. Al Qaeda does, mm -hmm. but it's not only Al Qaeda. You know. So that's a big question. Where is the violence coming from? I think what I find so distressing in the last two trips to Iraq is is the helplessness and hopelessness that Iraqis feel. Well, shouldn't the question I just asked be asked in every mosque in Iraq? Yeah, and people, I mean, there's a Sunni or Shia leader, you know, the majority leadership now is, is Shia. And so it's interesting to hear the Shia perspective, you know. They feel helpless to change it because the government is so corrupt and is only looking out for their own interest. Although I, one uh, Shia friend said, I said, well, what could you imagine bringing change, would bring change? And he didn't even vote in the last election. He said it was completely useless. He said, well, maybe if the, the walls of the green zone came down and people in the green zone could feel what everybody else is feeling who don't live in the green zone. And he also spoke of a general strike throughout the whole country, a general strike. But I mean, that was few and far between those types okay, of... What uh, is the level of dialogue in country between uh, Green Zone and outside of Green Zone and between uh, Shia I, and Sunni? I can't answer that. I don't know. Who are the, who I are mean, the what endogenous I, peacemakers? What, what I saw was the, what I experienced, the little I experienced, was in the families and the homes where I was. The Shia look at their own Shia stations TV stations and listen to their own um, imams, their holy men, their preachers, and the Sunni, the same. You know, they listen to, to their uh, leaders as well. And I have to say that both in Sunni and Shia homes, I didn't sense any animosity between, you know. In fact, one Sunni family I stayed with would have Shia friends calling to say, watch your back you know, this edict has just come out and this is going to be happening. So, I mean, there are signs of hope, but um, I didn't say tonight, I don't think here, that uh, with the exception of one person, everyone I spoke to would leave Iraq if they could, if they had the possibility to go somewhere. And I find that so deeply distressing because they love their country, you know. Mm -hmm. The only one that didn't, was an artist who said, my staying here is a form of resistance against the dirty war. He said, you know, Saddam could have been taken out at a parade. You know, your country had a plan to destroy our country. 
that that was his feeling. You know. But it, you know, it's uh, I think a question everybody's asking, and I would say, do you see an end to the violence? Uh, no, no. And so people are, and and yet life goes on. I mean, that's the most incredible thing to me is that people get up and they live their life and. Uh, they live together and they die together, and uh, there's there's something very existential and I don't know, just uh, mm. and th and that they could receive us with such warmth and hospitality is always has always been humbling to me, always. But they can differentiate. They know that there are good people everywhere and that there are bad people everywhere. You know, so yeah. yeah the Shiites and the Sunnis had a debate. What would the issues be? Security. You know how to how to have security in their country. How to have a normal. And I mean, they haven't had any normal. Why is there an interest in the bombing world? each other's mouths? I'm sorry. Why is there an interest in bombing well, each other's mouths? Well, I think maybe I could say yeah. something to that a little bit. Um, you know, under the years of Saddam Hussein's dictatorship, uh, the the Shia people were oppressed horribly. Um, you, you would hear people say after 2003, oh, believe me, Shia and Sunni, we all lived together peaceably before. That was not true. It simply wasn't true. If you were of a certain class level and you had a certain level of education or a certain level of income, you might have been able to intermarry or go to universities, Shia and Sunni, together. But there were, in the cities of Najaf, Karbala, Hult, Asmara, Basra, people were kept in a debased and terrified situation under the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. Now, in 1991, people thought that they could rise up because they thought now the United States has invaded and this is our chance. But what happened, the Iraqi leaders asked the United States, can we keep our helicopters? And the United States said yes. They said, can we keep our attack helicopters? And the United States said yes. So those attack helicopters lifted off from Baghdad. Now, I was in the country then. They went south, and they went to places like Karbala and Basra, all of those southern cities, and they mowed people down. And those that weren't bloodied and killed, were, if they were at all considered to be part of an uprising, were corralled into jails. They were tortured horribly. Many of them were kicked out of the country, or they fled the country. And so you had this simmering anger on the part of Shia people who said, this will never happen again. If we seize the reins of power, we will keep that power. So then what the United States invasion brought in in 2003 was the uprising of the Shia people who said, we will not give up this power. We, we have no safety if they we make give a it distinction up. between the, the, uh, uh, the government oppressors and the civilian uh, Sunni uh, uh, fellow citizen. Yeah, I believe me, I don't approve of this. I'm just trying myself to understand what happened. So there so was the a, a big overgeneralization involved in this. I'm sorry? Was an overgeneralization. They, they considered potentially all Sunnis were the enemies of the Shia. And there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of interaction, right? So now you've got Sunni people who've been armed by the United States, by Wahhabis, by Saudi Arabian groupings, and and so they're. The, the more that the violence escalates, the more every proxy group that wants the people to fight against each other have a chance of being sure they're going to keep fighting. So what would quell that? I think you're right, sir, to say that what, what if the imams in the mosques said, put your, your guns down? What if every gathering of ulema of uh, Muslim leadership said, put the guns down, stop the... But that right now has not been happening, and I don't at all want to cast blame or aspersion, just trying to understand the people who are fighting have had experience of their loved ones having been um, maimed, tortured, killed on both sides. Um, so let's see if we can uh, see if anyone else has something they, a question or a comment. Oh, I mean Camilla. Mm -hmm. and Comment and is is how how inspiring is for me to see you doing this work and 
I imagine that you represent a lot of hope for the people that is there and met you. Like you are like messengers, as you said, like you are building bridges, and and I imagine that that that's like a little light for them that maybe things can happen because there are people that doesn't forget here that they are there suffering. It was very, like it totally touched my heart when when, when I hear you said, uh, Kathy, Kathy, that finally there was somebody different than a soldier mm -hmm. that, they, that they can speak with about their pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes, I I don't know if you have if you have seen this video of a hummingbird mm -hmm. that is coming in the middle of a fire. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> it's a little bird, and the world is like getting fire, and all the big animals are like just watching the fire, and other people is crazy. Criticizing, and this this little hummingbird it's putting a little bit of water in their mouth and trying to <laughs> to stop the fire, and everyone is laughing of him. And he said, "I don't know if I'm going to stop this, but at least I'm doing my best." Mm -hmm. And my suspicions is that maybe I am now surrounded of hummingbirds, <laughs> <laughs> and and I want to be a hummingbird too. Yeah. Like to, to do my best and for me the images are very familiar I, I come from Colombia and mm. those are kind of the daily stories there too mm. so so I know how much represents to to have people from other parts of the world because that could make the difference sometimes Thank you, it's inspiring for me and I wish I could bridge, build bridges and be there for people too. You know, over the course of a long winter in Afghanistan, the young people that I know got the idea that um, they could find a friend, one friend in every country of the world. So they put on their walls all 195 countries named and then they set about trying to find a, a friend in each country. And the great thing was, um, their geography had never really been taught in school, so they were poring over atlases and trying to figure out, you know, who's where and what's Bob Marley and, and so, <laughs> or because their mentor, Hakim, is from Singapore and he's, you know, multilingual and a medical doctor, they figured Singapore must be this huge country. And then they found that dot <laughs> off the coast of Malaysia. Said, That's Singapore? <laughs> so anyway, uh, what you said certainly reminds me of that good project. They also found a friend in every, they did find a friend in every province in Afghanistan. They only found friends in 57 countries so far, but I don't think we've got Colombia yet, so you might be more of a bridge than I thought. <laughs> yes, I want to be part of that. Yes, and, and I know that requires courage, not just because it's, it's always a risk to be there. You are risking your life because it's not predictable what can happen. Um, but also because it requires courage to be there and if you, if you have your heart open and to witnessing mm -hmm. so much pain and so much violence. So, yes, I really admire what you are doing. I feel lucky to be here. Mm. Joshua. Oh. Yeah, I, I want to say uh, thank you. I mean, for bringing this to, to us. I mean, it's really inspiring just for me uh, to see uh, people working um, on like, bringing this message and, and witnessing and bearing witness to, to the atrocities that are committed in our name um, as the American people. Um, and one thing I'm curious about is like, how do you think, how do you think we can organize as people over here um, in a way that is that is anti-war um, and making it relevant to our local communities. Because I mean, when I when I see those pictures, I also think um, there's parts of there's parts of the city right now that are like the third world, 
um, that are experiencing this kind of uh, violence that has been perpetrated upon mm -hmm. them for um, generations. So, how does how does the the left uh, progressive movement in the states really uh, address uh, these structural structural problems without uh, you know, just calling upon our leaders to listen to us or uh, you know endless marching that gets nothing accomplished um, in, in your mind? I, I, I guess that's one of the questions I'm curious about. Yeah, um, I think one of the big uh, projects that the left, as you say, has, uh, like, we, we all know that there's this uh, military, prison, uh, media, industrial complex, and you can add a whole bunch of other things, but um, I guess the right is very organized and or you could say like the the one percent is very organized um, and the left there's so many different communities like you said who are suffering under the current state of affairs and um, a lot of our work I think has to do with meeting other people uh, who have different life experiences than our own um, because though this whole system keeps us from uh, meeting with them keeps us from seeing them, keeps us from uh, uh, conversing with people of different color skin, of different uh, color passport, or different amounts of money that we might have at our disposal. Um, so a lot has to do with self-education um, and being able to conceive of other folks' realities, um, and then build a common, a common struggle to improve all of our lives, and, and uh, that would invariably include U.S. imperialism and war. Um, and we, we would also be looking for say the elephants uh, to to the hummingbird <laughs> you know the people who actually work in positions of power like the military um, supporting the military members who may speak out about crimes uh, who may refuse to pull a trigger or refuse to press a button uh, that can be a, like a, a hose on the fire um, that Camilo talked about, and um, I also think about, and in terms of this project, talking about the the uh, humanitarian causes that we need investment in, and uh, Afghanistan needs investment in. Um, it's not just about our responsibility, but it's also about uh, dis displaying the need to end wars. The, the need to end uh, any amount of money going to any more destruction of people's lives and also of our habitats, um, of our earth. Uh, and so I, I, I kind of think that that's how we need to organize. A lot of it has to do with um, self-education and getting to the alternative communities where we're not anymore giving any of our treasure or talent or time to uh, the situ the current status quo. For people who might by any chance be in a position to, con to even entertain this idea, um, I, I found that by being a war tax refuser, um, it's been uh, easier for me to sort of shape my life. I mean, I sometimes joke that the IRS is my spiritual director, but um, I can't own anything because the IRS would take it. And I mean, that's not a suffering by, or a privation by any means. I mean, I, I don't even know how to drive a car, so I don't want to get involved in car culture, but I take car rides all the time. So, uh, But I, I think the more we can think about how our lives, as Betty is saying, alternatively, could be quite happy if we dropped out of systems of consumption, 
you know, that we're told will make us happy, but don't always really do that for us and figure out ways to live collectively and share jobs, share rent, share income, share transportation, you know, really make radical means of sharing and radical means of service kind of what would be the, um, the joy in life, uh, then I think we, we stand collectively a better chance of surviving in this habitat because I don't think the earth can survive us if we keep up with our current levels of consumption and waste. Yeah, I kind of find it interesting that you said one of the, one of the quotes, um, I can't remember who said it, but uh, that, that they want to teach their young people you know, in, in the new way, mm -hmm. in the way that, that we're meant to live. And I think that um, because of the, the violence and the trauma that we've, we've perpetrated upon the people, um, there's now almost a remediation that needs to happen, um, whether it's from the inside or from a global humanitarian effort um, of like, people really going in as healers, as people trying to restore um, and not trying to own or, or expropriate resources um, or else the, the cycle will just continue. I mean, whether we're the aggressors or not, us introducing um, that kind of brutalized violence against the uh, civilian population uh, invariably leads to, to you know, psychological trauma. Um, so, like, really talking about how do we how do we interact with the kids? How do we how do we make the next generation not um, you know more violent than the one that came before it? Um, that's something that, that's been in my mind just as trying to organize in, in, in a lot of these more impoverished communities in Rochester is how do you how do you deal with 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 kids that can't can't even go home and do homework because they don't, they don't have food um, or they, they don't have access to um, stable housing uh, and, and meanwhile we you know, continue to build like the office building it's, it's like the ideology is, it's the ideology itself is it's it's global in scope but it's it's local in impact uh, it doesn't matter if you're if you're here in the states or you know somewhere overseas it's it's the same system of exploitation that that is oppressing the human race. So I think a, a global effort to, to really rehumanize humans um, is, is uh, what's ahead of us. I mean, I, you, you're hinting that you know, there's, there's an awareness that's really you know, developing, and I, I very much agree with that. Um, but um, as somebody who's only been uh, active or awake these past few years, I'm seeing um, every day just more and more people clicking on and asking questions and looking for the knowledge um, that isn't offered by the mainstream, that isn't offered by you know, traditional conversations. And, and that gives me hope. You know, there's people asking asking questions, and that's a different kind of act, because you're not accepting passively. You're, you're actively engaging critical thinking. So, yeah, thank you. And also, maybe stay in touch with Harry Murray and others about nonviolent direct action, because uh, there's a lot of scope for that, I think. And, um, in my own experience, some of the best education I've ever had has come when I've been inside a jail or a prison. And then you learn a lot about the experiences of people who have been impoverished and underserved by our communities. And uh, it also helps co one cope with you know, the idea of, well, what if I get arrested? Or what if I go to court? Or what if I am in prison? Well, if, if, if that's part of your past experience, then you can at least draw from that to say, well, this is this is how I handle it, and I don't know whether I'll be afraid of it or not if it happens again, but you at least have more information at your disposal about how you handle it. Now, that's not a very good note on which to end this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Um, I wanted to find out, first of all, um, like the video you had, is that where can people find that? Oh, good, yeah. And um, also, like, um, I'm part of Rochester Media, but, um, you know, the use of alternative media. And, you know, we all have stories to tell because I look around this room and I know we're all doing things. Mm -hmm. and, and we all have stories, we all have situations, we all have things that we've encountered that, you know, help to educate others and to enlighten them of, of what's going on. And I encourage people to use, um, you know, like we're open publishing, so anybody can publish, but, um, you know, I think that it's real important because, yeah, we can't count on mainstream media. Mainstream media is owned by the corporations who build the war machines, 
and perpetuate this, you know, the, the system that uh, we have. So, you know, I encourage people to get involved with alternative media. It's wonderful that we sit here, but we're, this is reaching a small group of people. You know, if we reach out and we, if we use our, our alternative media, we hopefully can reach more people, but also to educate people about the alternative media. And I wanted to find out, has, have you had people that have gone with you and recorded what's gone on, and can people see that? Well, that video is one of about 169 three-minute videos that are at a, a website called OurJourneyToSmile.com. Okay. You just print that straight out, OurJourneyToSmile.com. Uh, there's a history to that title, and it's not a sugary saccharine history. Uh, but uh, really, it's worthwhile to visit, uh, especially if you're in a very down, sad mood. Um, try watching one of those videos, and it's almost sure to give you some uplift. Not this one about the shattered glass, but some of the others are really quite uplifting. Thanks for asking. Uh, okay, I think we're, um, maybe we'll take one more person, because Dave hasn't spoken yet. Um, and then we're going to close uh, for the evening. And Kathy, I really want to thank you, particularly your message of hope. Yeah. And something very important that really spoke to me tonight is the fact <coughs> that with this uh, Syrian situation, we are not looking at the scope of people who are saying no accepting the Tea Party people who will propose him at any point. Which brings me the hope I have is if we can carry this message forward and not pigeonhole ourselves on being left. Mm -hmm. I think we would have a lot more dialogue with people who see like us who would not necessarily be left, quote unquote. I think that would be a good move forward. Everybody in, nobody out. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Can I just make an announcement before people take off? Um, um, I wanted to first of all thank you for coming to Flying Squirrel. Um, you know, we love to have educational programs, so that's always wonderful. But um, when we're talking about oppression, um, Monday we're going to be showing a film on Malia and having a discussion. So come on out for that. That's at 7 o'clock. And also, um, we all need to have some fun. And um, on Wednesday, David Rovix, if you've oh. never heard him, he does a lot of social commentary through music and an activist through music. He's a lot of fun. He will be here on Wednesday. So we have some really good things coming up this week. And come out, have some fun, engage in good conversation. Bring your and, friends. Um, you know, so. Thank you. So everyone, um, two things real quick uh, as we close. One is on your way out the door, if you would take a moment and file past the uh, bean pole and um, make your comment through the beans, that would be wonderful. And um, so uh, let's have a nice, uh, some nice applause for a really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so wonderful.